So I'd like to start with um, honoring, this is my home, with honoring the ancestors and custodians of this land who kept it so pristine uh, for this time. And the reason I put the word gracias there, because gracias, or a state of gratitude, is really the essence and the heart of becoming a modern custodian, because what, what gracias does is it, it leads us into a state of grace, because we accept the way things are, which gives us the power to change. And so cultivating this attitude of gratitude is really so important. And as we shall see, as, as this talk progresses, that the changes that we make internally are vital. So what would it look like to be a modern Earth steward? How do we redefine our role here on Earth that makes meaningful sense and is valuable to all beings? Our human bodies are literally a bridge between the spiritual world and the physical world. And we have great power, and with that great power, great responsibility. We are the custodians. We are the dreamers. So everyone knows about this story with rapid change. And with this rapid change that's occurring now, this perfect storm, there's massive instability. And what we're going to find is is we need to be able to be flexible because it will not only be the survival but the thrival of the most flexible, the most flexible people, the most flexible ecosystems. So I'm going to be explore on how to become a modern custodian and what that would look like. So let me see a show of hands. Who in the audience here is indigenous? Okay, so. I thought so. So what planet are you from? <laughs> you know, this is, this is giving us an idea of how disconnected we are as a culture because we don't even see ourselves as indigenous. You know, so this is part of it because it's that disconnection which enables us to cut down those forests or pollute the water or not be concerned about what's going on somewhere else in the world or, to be more precise, what's going on in our bodies. And so... This disconnection could be seen as the source of all human problems. And so I'm going to explore a little way of how to reconnect with, you know, this living spherical arc that Buckminster Fuller called Spaceship Earth. So the first thing is understanding our relationship to ourselves, to each other and the Earth. And we need to shift from relationships that are owners with rights to custodians or stewards with responsibility. So we get the idea that we, from an egoic attachment point of view, we don't own our children, we don't own our partners, we don't own the earth. We've got, instead of rights, we've got a higher order, which is a responsibility. And so, like Chief Seattle's speech, famous speech, where he talked about selling the land he couldn't understand how he could sell the land because he didn't own it. So this shift in perspective becomes vital for creating a harmonic relationship. And it's perspective is everything. I mean, how many of you know that tomorrow the sun is not going to rise? In fact, it's never risen and it's not going to set because it's the earth that's spinning that gives us the perception of the, of the sun rising, and yet we all think of the sun rising. When I look at a mirror in the morning, if my hair's out of place, I would be crazy to try and comb the reflection in the mirror. You know, and this is what we're doing every day. So essentially what we need to do is comb our own hair, and the reflection shifts. And this is, this is quite controversial because it's so easy for us to be our heartstrings to be pulled and us to go out and try and save the world. We need to really shift our perspective. So many wizened elders and sages from around the world understood the mirror-like nature of reality. And the graceful transition from doom 
doom and gloom which we possibly face to heaven on earth depends on how we relate and our level of responsibility and sensitivity. Now, responsibility is literally our ability to respond. To respond as when we were hunter-gatherers, maybe millennia back, you know, we had to respond to changes in the environment. We had to respond to changes in our body. Our, ourselves and our tribes depended on it. But as we've moved from hunter-gatherers, pastoralists, agrarians, industrial age, we've, it's allowed us to be more and more disconnected. And the loss of sensitivity and responsibility go hand in hand. So Bill McDonough asked a beautiful question which guides this custodian process of how do we love all the children of all species for all time? Because if we could answer that question, we would actually be focusing exactly in the direction we need to be going. So how do we reverse the trend of reduced longevity, health, happiness, and leisure that our hunter-gatherer tribal ancestors experienced as we slide towards abject poverty materially and spiritually? Well, we need to cultivate the practice of perpetual renewal. We need to understand how we as humans, stewards of the planet, design, manage, maintain and co-create harmonic living systems of perpetual renewal. And you know, we've got a fantastic example around us, and that happens to be nature. And nature has some of these incredible qualities. And it's been around for a long, long time, and it's ever-evolving. And we've each got a local portal of nature very close at hand, and that's our body. So I'm going to tell you a story. I went to the dentist, and he was doing a painful procedure, drilling something in my mouth, gave me some nitrous oxide. And after a while, the, the dentist, the nurse, and that bright light in my eye all melted away into just a bright light. And this old wise old man with long hair and a long beard beckoned me and it looked remarkably like me in the future and he said come let me show you something and he took me to a wonderful lake and on this lake, lake grew this beautiful lotus and I was looking at the lotus and he showed me how the energy coming out of my eyes going into the lotus was able to be absorbed by this beautiful flower it was being nourished as if the same nourishment from a sun. And not only that, he showed me how, because I was looking at it in a particular way of recognition of its beauty, its energy flowed from its shape and colour and fragrance into my senses and nourished me. And this, this was profound. He then, he then said, come and have a look over here, and showed me the scene of, of conflict. And immediately, I could see a victim and an aggressor and my judgment and my emotional attachment to an outcome of how to stop this thing. I had a need, a need to stop it. And what happened is my body constricted. And he showed me how that constriction in my body, that stress, slowed the blood flow, slowed the energy movement. How the cells started to starve of oxygen and how stagnation became disease. And I realized that this dance that we have as we move through the environment is, is akin to this. We have the ability to absorb through the valve of beauty and consume almost everything that we see, hear, feel. When we, when we see a bird, I mean hear a bird singing, if we can recognize that song as beautiful, it makes that sound digestible to us. So. The body is possibly, and I, I propose is, the most advanced technology we've come across. Now, it, it is able to absorb all of this incredible energy that many different cultures have explored and given the names like chi and prana. And what it does is it absorbs this, uh, uh, a pranayamic yogi will tell you that if you breathe, you can extract this energy from air. And when we eat, 
our stomach is designed to extract it from the food via bacteria. And so we're extracting this energy through a myriad of different sources. Now, there are a whole lot of things in nature where this energy is not only concentrated, but amplified. And many of these things have helped cultures throughout time not only enhance their relationship to this energy, but uptake it even more powerfully. Because once we have a large amount of this energy in our body, the first thing it does is it heals. The next thing it does is it raises our awareness and increases our creativity. And then after that, we, we tend to get a radiance around us that is absorbable by all of human creatures, I mean all of, all of nature's kingdoms, including other humans. And so, some of these things like ayahuasca, sun gazing, ormus, and darkroom techniques where Tibetan lamas would sit in caves up high in the Himalayas, or Amazon Indians would drink brews made of plants. These would actually tune people in by turning off the mind and turning on a different mind, the heart mind, which enabled them to really have a, a Gnostic communication with the very nature that they were communicating with because we would be able to ask nature directly if it approved of what we were doing. So how does this work? Well, the incredible thing is that our blood, the center of the blood molecule, is iron. And you may say iron, so what's so fantastic about iron? But iron can uh, be affected by electromagnetic energy. And we're literally living in a sea of electromagnetic energy. And it just so happens that ochre, which is the same iron, rusted iron, in clay, is used by different cultures all around the world to put over their body to amplify that signal and to amplify it in a particular way so that they can conduct this energy into the body. Now just imagine that your blood cells are these little donut-shaped cells spiraling in your blood. And I want you to think back, those of you who can, to when music was recorded on tape. It was a piece of cellophane with rust on it. And your magnetic head would align that rust, and you would be able to record music in the, sh in the alignment of that rust on the cellophane, so much so when it played on the playback head, you could hear the music. Well, imagine your body being a really sophisticated, multi-track recording system that enabled you to pick up the signals of the environment and record them in your body, and at the same time, pick up the signals of your body and, rec and play them into the environment. So each organ then becomes like a recording and playback head. Maybe your kidneys will record the level of fear, your liver, the level of anger, your heart, the level of compassion. And so as we, as we move through in the environment, we are literally walking through the sea of electromagnetic energy. And and the signal that's moving through, you could take the analogy of a TV. The pictures are not on the TV. When the TV is tuned, we have a stream of information. But we, our bodies are very sophisticated but work on the same principle. So then each different shape that we make with our body, or each different thought that changes the field around our body, changes the permeability and what we pick up. And so, our singing and dancing and prayer and meditation modulates not only the quantity but the quality of this energy that we pick up. And our DNA is at the center of this. Once we pick up enough energy in our bodies, there's a whole array of what the Indians call city powers. Telepathy, teleportation, physical immortality, space-time travel. That are apparently available to the body if only we had the instruction manual. So what's the best way of actually connecting into this environment other than just walking and talking and singing and dancing and making love? It's eating. And the reason eating is so powerful is because We've got 
a film of bacteria everywhere covering our stomachs, covering the surfaces of leaves. And these bacteria digest. We're not eating for ourselves. We eat for these bacteria because we absorb their excretions. Our stomachs, you may be shocked to know, are outside of our bodies. And so as we eat, these bacteria will find, actually project a field of consciousness. And so if we eat too much sugar, we'll get a candida explosion and they project a field of more sugar, more sugar, more sugar. So it becomes, eating becomes a revolutionary and evolutionary act. And all our food is generated by the sun. And it, it's, it's vital that we, we actually balance our internal and external landscapes because the bacteria in the soil happen to be almost identical to the bacteria in our gut. So we have to really look at some of the modern farming practices that we have. Our primary source of bioenergy is the sun. And we need to track these trails of living energy and really move to a solar economy if we want to be custodians. And our measure of success will be our ability to trap living solar energy and use it to enrich all of life on Earth. And so then we become the sacred nectar gatherers. And our tools, our tools could be a guitar is a tool. An iPhone can be a tool. An idea is a seed. So the sacred cross is a story about how plants are drawing in the future, light, cosmic energy, drawing up all the ancestors and, and turning it into complex sugars that drive an array of fantastic systems, our food, our medicine, our fiber, our fuel, our building materials. And humans are like walking trees. What they get to do is they consume that energy and they move around and they form this level of the cross. And as they radiate, they radiate this frequency that enables them to tune into everything. And so we, we through our, our love, and our meditation and our singing and our dancing, we radiate that energy back. And so we form the sacred cross, the sacred cross, the cycle. And at the bottom of that is, and most importantly, is the soil, as the previous TED Talker spoke about. And so the primary strategy then becomes that. Plan, plant, planet. The grace that can accompany this transition is dependent on our ability to grow resilient communities, shift toward authentic relationship, awake, become self-responsible, self-reliant, see beauty and live harmoniously with all that share this earth, like cells in a healthy body. And so, what's left is just one practice. Cultivate self-love. And the self seems to start here. But let me assure you, the self radiates out and encompasses all. Thank you. <laughs>